Welcome to the world's greatest show. And we are back with a brand new unit. So if you are not super enthralled with the genetics unit, then you probably will find this one a little bit more tolerable. Well, maybe. But anyways, we're now on the evolution. And evolution is one of the aspects of biology that is more evidence-based. And there's, and even though we're fairly confident in the theory, there still is a lot that we are learning about it. So evolution is based on evidence. And we are going to explore some of that evidence and we're going to see how it helps to show that the theory of evolution is valid. So it isn't really something we can test in a lab. We have computer models, but we don't really have we can't really analyze it under a microscope, but we can use certain factors of evidence in order to show that the theory is sound. Okay, so let's go ahead and get at it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the raw definition of evolution. So what exactly is evolution? Well, for starters, it is considered to be change over time. So evolution is simply change over time. Now, everything changes over time. The question is, is how does it change? So, so for evolution, we kind of tinker this a bit to be change over time in response to environmental stressors. So that's basically evolution. And evolution is the reason why life looks like it does. If anything is on the earth currently, and we haven't overhunted it, overfished it, or otherwise just overkilled it to uh, reduce numbers or to extinction. It is here because how it looks gave it a survival advantage in the environment. Because basically, animals are constantly competing with each other. Well, animals, life forms in general, are always competing with e each other. And that brings in the idea of natural selection. So natural selection, I've kind of dialed down the definition to um, adaptations accumulated, sorry for that messed up word, accumulated over time that confer a survival advantage in a specific environment, in a specific environment, with keyword on specific. So in other words, the environment chooses what survives. So it is environment specific. I say this because because an organism that has a great ability to, to survive in the Arctic probably wouldn't have such a, such a great advantage in a forested region. Or maybe something uh, that lives in an area where there's lots of nuts and seeds or worms, um, which is perfect food for a bird, probably wouldn't survive so well in an area where there is mainly large mammals or rodents. So the environment chooses what, sur what survives. So basically the environment weeds out, if you want to use that term, weeds out organisms that are not fit to survive. 
And more or less, the most fit, fit organisms have the greatest amount of offspring. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just type this here. So the most fit organisms have the most offspring. Since DNA is, is, is unique to each, each and every organism, when they reproduce, they are going to pass down their genes to the subsequent generation. So they pass down unique genes, which if you recall from, from genetics alleles, unique genes to next generation. Uh, this is extremely beneficial because then the offspring have a pretty good chance of uh, inheriting a trait that will give them a survival advantage. Now let's let's talk about this term adaptation. So adaptation is a um, trait in organism involved evolves, sorry, evolves that gives it a survival advantage a survival advantage in an environment. Uh, there's several different types of adaptations. For example, you could have coat color that blends with environments, that blends with environments. That's an example. You could have stealthy hunting technique. I know that's vague, but you get the idea. You could have ability to burrow. I mean, you're, you're seeing here that things that animals do to survive are, are called adaptations. Because they because they had to evolve them over time. Excuse me. Oh, I hate that feeling when you think you're gonna sneeze and you don't. But thankfully, I didn't, or else I would be sanitizing my laptop and my wonderful drawing tablet. Okay, so if you want some examples of of evolution, I'll gladly give you some. Okay, so let's say that I start a new rule. What if I say that only students that answer their discussion questions in four or more sentences will be allowed to stay in the, in the course? Now, many of you are going to be very disappointed because you would be, you would be disenrolling and I probably would get some very bad, um, some very bad, bad feedback on my evaluations, which I think you guys were supposed to fill out. Yeah, well, anyways, I don't, I'm not, not sure if you still can. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you drop the course if you don't have four sentences for your discussion questions. But anyways, what if I made that rule? Well, in that case, quite a bit of our class population would be uh, weeded out from, the, from the, the population. Now, why did this happen? Well, because me, the environment, decided to make a change that affected which individuals could stay in the course. It's, it's, uh, it was just a random thing that happened. Um, I woke up one day, I was so tired of reading discussion questions that were only like a sentence or too long. I got fed up, you know, maybe if I won the lotto, that wouldn't have happened, but that hasn't happened yet. So bad, bad mood, woke up, terrible mood. But you're seeing here that it's nothing really that you, that you did. It is just the way that the environment, me, decided to, to uh, respond. Re reminds me of a great quote from Captain Picard in Star Trek. 
sometimes you can do everything right and and still fail that's that's not failure that's called life um yeah well i know that that sounds harsh but in the animal kingdom ladies and gentlemen that is very harsh all right so what about what about an adaptation all right now adaptations result from random genetic mutations so adaptations result from random mutations. Uh, the thing with evolution that you have to keep in mind is we're not talking on scales of human lifespans. We're not talking in scales of days or weeks or years. We're talking in scales of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Um, now, we see evolution in, in the uh, 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 abbreviated way with viruses and bacteria because since they since they re reproduce so fast and they don't have the ability to proofread uh, the replicated DNA and RNA, they tend to mutate pretty fast and um, change. So, so in, in other words, these adaptations result from mutations which are mistakes in replicating DNA, in replicating DNA. Now, I, I, I do want to say that most mutations, 99 point, probably 99.9% .9 of them, uh, actually result in, in diminished function, meaning that what they do is that they, is that they mutate and they either inhibit the, the function of the protein or otherwise make the protein completely non-functional. So most mutations, so I'll say that 90, and, and this is not proven, but I'm just saying this off the, the top of my head, 99.9% of mutations diminish, it's not how you spell it, diminish, diminish or inhibit function. In other words, most mutations just, just work to break the protein. Um, obviously, that is not good for, for uh, survival. However, once in a great while, you'll have a mutation that actually gives a survival advantage. So this is a random mistake that just happened to make the protein function even better. Think about it like this. You 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 go to the you go to Wendy's or whatever. You order, I'll say, you order a chocolate frosty. So you get your frosty, it's vanilla. At, at first you're upset, but then you, you're like, well, you know, I don't feel like going back inside. You taste the uh, the vanilla frosty, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much better. And you discover that you love the vanilla frosty. It's made your it's made your life so much so much better, so much more happy and fulfilled. Now that was an accident. Maybe if, instead of that chocolate frosty, maybe you would have gotten like I don't know a cherry a cherry coke, and you would have been like, "This is nasty. I'm never coming back here again," or or something similar. So in this case, it was a complete mistake that just happened to make your life a bit better. Well, that's basically with mutations. Normally, when, when you get the wrong order, you're very unhappy. You're very, un, very unhappy. You're like, this is disgusting. It's nasty. Um, but once in a while, it will actually make things a little bit better. To give you an example here, we'll have the SARS-2 virus, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. So we'll say that this is the starting stream. So this is the um, uh, this is the Wuhan strain, or the or the strain that was isolated in in uh, the Wuhan province. And we'll say that it infects you. Um, I'll just say sixty one percent of the time. Exposure um, causes infection. 
Now, all viruses mutate at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, the SARS-2 virus actually has an ability to slightly proofread its DNA. So it doesn't make mistakes quite as often. Sorry, I think it's an RNA-based base virus. I'll have to double check though. But it has an ability to slightly proofread its genetic material. So it doesn't make mistakes all that often. But when it does, usually it creates a non-functional virus. You never know that, that, these, that these were made because they don't do anything. You'll have a, a maybe one or two made from a mutation and then the rest will just, um, uh, will just die off because they, they can't affect cells. On occasion though, you might have a, a, a variant that does exactly the same. So variant one might have same um, infect, same infection rate. Okay, great. So it changed, but it didn't really do anything. And then you can have variants, how to say variant two, and this one actually can infect now 78% of the time. Exposure causes infection. Now, why is this? Well, that's because the, the spike protein, which is found on the surface of the virus, actually can, um, can get into cells better than the starting strain. Now, there's a couple of viral variants that, that, that have this, this adaptation. Uh, the South African virus, the UK variant, and the, um, and the, 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 the Brazilian virus. So those, those different variants, they actually have mutations that can help it get into the cell better. But keep in mind, out of the over, well over, and I haven't checked the case counts, well over a million people that have been affected, more than that, I think it might be 10, 10 million by now, uh, that have had confirmed infections. We've only had three variants that have actually had increased infectability. That just shows you the vast majority of mutations create something that is not functional. And keep in mind, viruses mutate at such a faster rate than, um, than multi-celled life forms. So it's, so it's very hard to see evolution in action with, uh, with, with uh, complex uh, animal life. Now, if you want another example, this is a cheesy example that I call Giraffe Island. And Giraffe Island is actually a island filled with giraffes. And there's three kinds of vegetation on giraffe islands. We have small bushes, we have medium-sized trees, and then we have tall trees. It's a very tall tree, very tall. Now, there are three variants of giraffe on the islands. So first of all, we have medium neck giraffe. So we have medium neck giraffe, it's a good animal. It's a good old giraffe. Have a lifespan of about 25 years, in case you're curious. And this giraffe is actually perfect at reaching this medium sized tree. Now, on the other side, we have bulldog neck giraffe. Here's a little giraffe. It has a short, stubby neck. So I guess it kind of is like a giraffe dog. And you see here that bulldog neck giraffe is perfectly situated to eat the whatever grows on the bush. Now, on the other hand, we have Accordion neck giraffe. Accordion neck giraffe. And you see here that it is perfectly situated to go get the tall tree.
Now, the reason why these three giraffes can live in harmony on the island is because their unique adaptations allow them to uh, develop a niche where they um, they have a certain food source where there's no there's there's no competition. So therefore, their niches, which is basically um, which is basically the roles that they fulfill in their environment, we'll talk about that later. Niches do not overlap. Now we see here that the accordion neck giraffe can't really outcompete the medium neck giraffe for the medium tree because it needs to, you know, crank its neck and it's and it's not advantageous. But the medium neck giraffe will be able to outcompete it every time. And the long neck giraffe and the the accordion neck giraffe doesn't have a chance uh, to get the bush because, well, um, picture if. I tied, if you tied your hands behind your back and then I put a bowl of oatmeal on the ground and I told you to eat it, you can't, you, you can't sit down though. Uh, you have to keep standing because giraffes can't exactly sit down and ask you, hey, go eat that oatmeal. Even if you're really hungry, you can't get it. Well, so the accordion neck giraffe can't go after the bulldog neck giraffe's bush. Okay, so it's perfectly situated, it's, it's perfectly designed through years of evolution. It's, it's developed an adaptation that allows it to have its own food source. Medium neck giraffe is the same. It has evolved over X number of years. It has developed an adaptation, a medium neck, that lets it eat the, the medium sized tree. Um, and if there's in a, and uh, Possibly if there's an emergency situation, maybe it could get the bush, I don't know. Um, and now we have bulldog neck giraffe. No one's gonna outcompete it for the, for the bush. But on the negative side, it can't reach the tree or the super big tree. Now, as long as the environment does not change, these three giraffes um, with, their, with their, their different traits can survive in harmony. But one day, disaster strikes. Uh, it's, it's a bad day on Giraffe Island. A fungus decimates the population of uh, bushes. And a torn tornado rips out all the tall trees. What bad luck. Luckily, though, the, the long neck giraffe uh, was able to seek shelter somewhere. So now what's happened is that the environment has changed. We now have no more small bushes and no more super big trees. So now what, is, what has happened is that the accordion neck giraffe and the bulldog neck giraffe now are not, do, do not have an advantage in surviving in the environment. Bulldog neck giraffe cannot jump up and eat the tree certainly can't outcompete the medium neck giraffe for the, the medium tree. And the accordion neck giraffe, it, it, it has no ability to outcompete the medium neck, neck giraffe for food because the tree's too small. So over time, we are, are gonna see that the accordion neck giraffe and the bulldog neck giraffe are going to be eliminated from the, from the population. They can't find food. And over time, they will not, not be able to survive in the environment. And what's going to happen is that medium neck giraffe is going to become the dominant, um, the, the dominant type of giraffe. So this is the idea of natural selection. Natural selection, I guess you can say that the environment chooses. Right at it. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk more about gene flow and more about the process of evolution and why evolution occurs the way that it does. And the first thing we're going to talk about is a concept called gene flow, which is very important for the survival of a species. So gene flow... What the general definition of this is, is 
gene flows occurs when new genes, actually, I kind of, when new genes, kind of combine the two words there, enter a population. When new genes enter a population. And this is very important. Genetic diversity is very important. Now, why is genetic diversity important? Well, let's take a look at the cheetah, for example. All cheetahs are basically clones of each other. There is very little genetic diversity in the cheetah populations. So there's a virus that is so impactful on cheetahs, so deadly, that it's in danger of wiping out the entire cheetah population. Because since cheetahs are basically clones of each, each other, this virus is affecting them all the same. So the fact that there's not much genetic diversity in the population prevents there from being cheetahs that have resistance to this, to this virus. If that was the case, then the cheetahs would not be nearly as affected by the lack of genetic diversity. Um, another example, papayas. All papayas are basically genetically modified now because once again, a virus entered the papaya populations and it was either a virus or fungus, one of those, but it was decimating them. We probably would not have papayas if we did not genetically modify them to resist that, that pathogen. Uh, I know I'm continuing on, on plants. The Irish potato famine occurred because the populations grew the potatoes that were, that grew the biggest and the fastest and tasted the best. They felt no reason to grow any other type of potato species. Well, I believe it was a fungus came in uh, that, that infected all that type of a potato resulting in famine. So you're seeing why gene flow is really important to helping a population survive. If you want to go back to our talk on Giraffe Island, think about it like this. If Giraffe Island only had bushes and the only type of giraffe present was bulldog neck giraffe, uh, bulldog neck giraffe, could you imagine seeing a giraffe that has a bulldog neck? Do you know how, how horrifying that would, that would be? All right, so this is a giraffe, bulldog neck giraffe. Now, everything's fine and good as long as the environment doesn't change. But if something happens and wipes out these bushes, then the, the entire giraffe population would die because there's no other variants of the giraffe that could do things like eat leaves from a tree. So gene flow, is, flow, gene flow is really important. How does gene flow occur? Gene flow occurs when, when animals or when, uh, when organisms immigrate into a new area. They bring genes into the, the population. Now, what else results in, in gene flow? Mutations. Mutations are random changes in the genetic code. genetic code that results in new alleles. I do want to make things clear about mutations that results in new alleles. Remember, an allele is a variant of a gene. Anyways, I do want to make one thing clear about mutations. They are almost always uh, deleterious, meaning that they always, almost always decrease the function of a gene. Most of the time, that's the case. Like you hear all the time about coronavirus mutations. 
Um, and now we have a couple of variants like the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, the New York variant. But you're only hearing about the ones that made the virus function better. You aren't hearing about the thousands and thousands of mutations that made the virus function worse. So mutations almost always are deleterious. However, on occasion, mutations can make new alleles that are functional. So to give you an example, you might have here a brown mouse. And a mutation might happen that makes the mouse, um, I don't know, maybe like a nice orange color. Or maybe you'll, you'll have a mutation that will also make it a, oh, seriously? Hold on, my wireless drawing tablet decided that it doesn't want to be wireless any, anymore. Everything needs to be charged, doesn't it? Even drawing tablets. But yeah, so in this case here, we had a mutation that made a new, um, uh, that created a new allele that now makes this mouse more of an orangish color. Oh wait, I gotta put it in here. One second, I, me being a technology Neanderthal, I need a new allele that could teach me how to plug things in apparently. All right, here we are, we're good to go. Yeah, so we can have a new mutation that results in a new allele of orange. So this is caused by a mutation. How do mutations occur? Uh, either, either random errors in the S phase of the cell cycle where when the, the DNA is copied Sometimes mistakes can happen that aren't corrected, and that can result in a change in gene function or the environment. There are things in the environment that can cause your DNA to mutate. Usually that's not a good thing. Like you aren't gonna sprout a third arm or anything, but you, you, you could develop cancer or something similar. So anyways, mutation, creates a new allele, but mutations also can, can do things like create albinoism, which is the result of a dysfunctional gene. Can't really draw an albino mouse here. But uh, I think you get the, the idea. So maybe this is going to happen, we'll just say 99.9% .9 of the time, the, the, the random mistake would just cause the gene for, for making hair pigment dysfunctional. However, that 0.1% will on occasion actually change the gene in the way that allows it to function just as well, if not better. Now, this is good because let's say that this brown mouse lives in a nice brown forest. Let's say something happens and the forest turns orange. Now, the brown mouse is going to stick out like a sore thumb, and it's going to be more prone to predation, and it won't be able to hide from prey as well. Meanwhile, the orange mouse will be able to survive because it's now in an orange forest and it will be able to resist um, being attacked by predators or being spotted by prey because it can blend in. So you're seeing that mutations also can cause, can cause gene flow because now this random orange mouse is going to spread its genes throughout the population. Um, on the other hand, we can have something called inbreeding, which is not preferred at all. So inbreeding is the opposite of what you want in a population. 
So what happens is that you have a lack of genetic diversity due to insufficient gene flow. You also have an increase of recessive disorders. That's because if you remember last unit, it, an organism can only have a recessive trait if they inherit two recessive alleles from one from each parent. That usually doesn't happen if the parents are um, very diverse from each other. But we can see it in populations where there's not much uh, genetic diversity. So the reason why it, it isn't good to have um, individuals that are very genetically similar to reproduce is because if there's a recessive allele in that line, then it's going to continue to show up in subsequent generations. We see that actually in the white tiger population, which is actually why breeding white tigers is considered so immoral. Uh, a white tiger occurs naturally about one in every 10,000 Bengal tiger births. Yes, a white tiger is a Bengal tiger that has a gene mutation. So one in 10,000 births, somebody found a white tiger once and started to breed the white tiger with Bengal tigers until they got more white tigers. Then they started to breed them. And now you have an entire white tiger line based off uh, the original two white tigers um, made it. Because of that, in the white tiger population, there's a, a lot of, uh, of recessive disorders that, um, that pop up. So in, in breeding makes a population more prone to extinction because if just one thing changes in the environment that is not advantageous to them, then they are going to become extinct. Like the example I showed you with the, with the mice. If you have a brown forest, Yes, everything is brown in this forest. The trees, the grass, the dirt. And you have a brown, brown mouse here and there. Notice how well they can blend in. So if they want to sneak up on, an, I don't know, a, a worm. I know that's a big, that's a big worm or something, then they'll be able to hide on, um, until it's too late for the, for the, the prey to see them. And if there is a predator around, oh gosh, what can I draw as a predator? Uh, I don't know what eats mice. Um, maybe a hawk. There you go. Nice hawk. So this hawk is on the prowl. For some food, but it can't find the, the mice because they're, they're blended in. Okay, what if something happens with the environment, maybe climate change, probably, and changes the environment. So the brown forest is now a orange forest. Orange forest, orange trees, orange grass, orange trees. Now look how much things have changed. Now the hawk is going to be able to easily spot the brown mouse. And the worms are going to easily spot the mice as well because the entire forest is orange and the mice are brown. So due to the lack of genetic diversity, the mice will die. Unless there is some variance around, 
that were that could blend in with the environment. And if that's the case, then the mass population will continue to survive. I mean, it will look different, but you'll still have survival. That's why inbreeding is bad and gene flow is good. Um, so, so this thing here, when recessive uh, disorders increase in prevalence in the population, we call that an inbreeding depression. And that's a term for when recessive disorders begin to appear more in a population. All right, so now we're on to non-adaptive evolution. So first, let's talk about the opposite, adaptive evolution. Adaptive evolution. This is also known as natural selection, basically. So organisms in a population that have advantageous traits traits can better survive better survive in an environment and reproduce this is basically flexing it's it's uh it's one organism flexing on another saying, hey, I can survive better in this environment. So I'm gonna outcompete you and have more offspring than you because I can survive better. Or something like that. But on a more serious note, it's if an organism in the population, if it has an adaptation that allows it to survive better, then because it can survive better, it will be able to live long enough to have offspring. And of course, the offspring will have their traits. That is adaptive evolution. Non-adaptive evolution is basically random chance. It is just a random event that has, a, um, that has um, reduced, the, uh, re reduced the gene pool. So, so in other words, adaptive evolution is a result of thousands and thousands of years of, um, of, of organisms in a population evolving adaptations in order to best survive in the environment. It's a slow, gradual process because remember, most new alleles are made from mutations, beneficial mutations, and it takes time for, 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 for a mutation to appear that leads to an adaptation where the organism that inherits that mutation can survive better. So adaptive evolution is a result of thousands and thousands of years of evolution until, until the perfect organism, well, or better or better organism is created that can survive in an environment. Non-adaptive evolution is a bit different. This is when um, random events reduces genetic diversity, diversity in a population. A random event reduces genetic diversity in a population. It isn't survival of the fittest. It's more of throw your hands up and say, oh, well, um, stuff happens. So I do want to make it clear, non-adaptive evolution does not, result, does not result in survival of the fittest. This is just something really serious happens. And um, uh, certain genes or certain alleles have been wiped out from the population. So non-adaptive evolution does not choose the most uh, fit species. Instead, it just chooses the ones that 
just happen to be just 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 happen to survive. Now there's two types of non-adaptive evolution. Let's see three. The first type is called genetic drift. This usually occurs in small populations. So what happens is that in a small population, small population, the distribution of alleles of alleles can differ wildly. I know wildly is kind of a strong, strong term, but but basically um, certain alleles can disappear from a population due to, uh, I'll just say unfavorable probabilities. Probabilities. All right, so certain alleles can disappear from a population due to unfavorable probabilities. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to our genetic cross here. And we're gonna go ahead and do coat color. We're gonna stick with our example here. We'll go ahead and say that this is an example of dominant recessive. We'll say that big A equals brown, small A equals orange. And let's say that we start with a population of two mice. We'll say that one is orange, which has the genotype of small a, small a, and one is going to be brown. So it's going to have, so this is the founding population. So this is going to have a genotype of what we'll just say is going to be big A, big A. And they reproduce and they have offspring that are all brown. All right, my mice are getting sloppier and sloppier, but you get the idea. So they have all mice that are brown, but have the genotype big A, small a. So I'll just say that they have four of these, four of these mice. Another mouse. And they all have the genotype big A, small a. Now let's say that we are gonna cross these mice here. And let's say that in this pairing here, they are going to reproduce. And if you remember the, um, the outcome of a cross between two heterozygotes, it's basically a three to one distribution of, um, of uh, the dominant versus the recessive phenotype. But we do know there's a 25% chance that the recessive allele can become prevalent. Well, in the short term, probability can, can vary wildly. And each time these two mice have offspring, there's a 25% chance that they'll have a brown mouse. Okay, well, let's say that they have four offspring and it just happens that three of them are small a, small a, which definitely has beaten the odds. And one of them is going to be big A, small a. Now let's say in this mouse pairing, remember once again, 25% chance, but let's say they also beat the odds.
Now, if we look here, due to random chance, we see that we have a much bigger population of the orange mice than what would be expected with probability. Very similar as if you were to flip a coin three or, or five times, you could have all the outcomes come out heads or tails. Even though the probability is 50-50, in the short term, you can have wild variance. So what's, what's going to happen here is that now the, the recessive allele is so prevalent in the population, following this pattern, the dominant allele is going to be weeded out from the population. So what has happened is that in genetic drift is that um, the frequency of, of alleles can change from one generation to the next. So this usually reduces the gene pool. Now next is called the founder effect. Founder effect. And this occurs when a small segment of a population leaves and resettles elsewhere. This is a problem for a couple of reasons. One, it reduces gene pool of original population and also new population has limited gene pool. So both populations have been affected the existing one and the new one. So what can happen here, for example, is you can have a population of, I'll just say, dark red um, giraffes and pink giraffes. And something can happen where these, these two giraffes decide to um, decide to leave and settle elsewhere. So they are going to found a new population or find a new population. Because of that, the, the starting population has, has fewer genes. So, it, so, so it's actually lost some of the, of the genes. Well, I shouldn't say lost, but it has had the frequency changed, which is going to reduce genetic diversity. And then the new population is going to have low genetic diversity because as you can see, they don't have the pink phenotype here. Uh, the founder effect is deleterious because usually there's lots of inbreeding in populations um, uh, that were that were started through the, the through the founder effect, and there are several populations where, within their their population within their ethnic group, there's a high prevalence of recessive disorders, because they are the product of a population that was based on the founder effect. Uh, now the next is a bottleneck effect, and this is just flat out unfair. That's the best, best way that I can put it. So a bottleneck effect, bottleneck effect is a disaster um, changes the frequency of alleles in the population. Alleles in the population. Um, results in lack of genetic diversity. There's lots of examples we can use 
one of my favorites is an example of how we have all these all these beetles in a population, like we have brown beetles. And then we have green beetles. And some some businessman comes and, and he's in a hurry and he steps. Uh, yes, he steps and wipes out a large portion of the beetle population. So what has happened is that a natural disaster has drastically changed the, the, the frequency of the, the alleles. Now the brown phenotype, which was the most common, now has been extremely reduced. And now the green phenotype is the, is the dominant, um, well, phenotype. Now that isn't always good because the brown beetle was, was the most um, populous because it had the best chance of surviving in the environment. A random natural disaster now has reduced the, the, um, the population of the, of the brown beetles, and now the green ones are the only ones left. If they are not capable of, of, of surviving well in their, in their environment, then the population period will be extremely reduced. Because now the most common type of beetle is the one that does not have the greatest chance of living uh, or existing in the environment. This is just randomness. This is just a random thing happened where um, the large part of the beetle population just got wiped out. It's, it's, it's one of those things, it's stuff happens. If you want another example, we can go back to Giraffe Island. It's kind of the example that I did earlier or last last unit. So we have trees because giraffe islands. And then we have bushes. And then accordion of trees. And it's like, okay, well, what if the medium neck giraffe was the most common because they're the most medium trees? Well, if something happened to these medium trees, then all of a sudden the medium giraffe population would be decimated because now there's only bushes and accordion trees. The medium neck giraffe would not be able to, to survive now because a natural disaster wiped out their main, their main source of food. It's one of those things, well, oh well, um, things, things, things change, you can adapt, so see ya. But of course, that's going to reduce genetic diversity because now you've lost the medium neck giraffe. So it's going to become much less common in the environment. All right, now there's two types of evolution and it's very important we talk about them. One is called divergent evolution. This is real evolution. because it results in something called speciation, which is creation of a new species uh, from an existing species. So that happens here is that you can have species one and over time, it's going to incur random mutations until eventually you are going to have species two. Species two. And do you know what? Maybe another species diverts from this two. So you can have species three. So what happened is that species one is the original species. Um, random mutations happened that took, took, that took species one and it became eventually two separate species, species two and species three. So this is called divergent evolution because new, new species um, diverge from existing species. So this is real evolution. Convergent evolution is 
much different. So with convergent evolution, environment allows for a narrow phenotype for survival to occur. Let's look at birds for example. So if birds, if birds want to fly, so let's put down requirements for flying. They must be relatively small. They must have wings. They, they must have um, webbed feet. I don't know, webbed feet to grab. But actually, I think web feet isn't probably the best one. I'll just, I'll just put down, um, I'll just put on um, um, uh, scaly feet, I guess, to grab things. Light bones. and a diverse diet because who knows where they'll fly and who knows where they'll, where they'll find food. And also ability to lay eggs. Because it's very hard to fly if you're trying to internally incubate young. Now, the reason why I say this is because with convergent evolution, you see birds and you might think, oh, all these birds have a have a have a head or a, a, a relatively small head. Most of them have a beak. Most of them, or they all have wings. They all have feathers. They all have scaly feet. They all have light bones. So you might say they're all all related. That's not the case. It's more like they have to have all of these qualities if they want to fly. Therefore, every everything that is a um, that, that we call a bird may not be genetically similar. They could be genetically different. They could have no common ancestors, but they just look alike. It's kind of a, it kind of goes in line with what's called the doppelganger effect. Some of you have probably heard of it. Doppelganger effect. I think that's how you, how you spell it. So basically people that look alike People that look alike are assumed to be related. That is not always the case. There's some people that can look very similar that are not even in the same, same ethnic group. There's something on YouTube where two young, young women did look pretty similar. I, I, I want to say they were twins, like how they were trying to play it up in the, the video, but they could definitely pass as, as sisters, very close sisters. And when they did the 23MB test, it turned out that they weren't even close to, to, to being related. So everything that you see that is a bird, it isn't because they are from, uh, they, they diverge from the same ancestor, it's because with evolution, they had to evolve in a way to have all these requirements or else they could not fly. That's just it. Think of it like, 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 like airplanes from, well, um, like airplanes from different manufacturers, Airbus, Boeing, I don't know. But you can look and see that they all more or less look the same because that's the only thing that's that's the only way you can build a plane that will have it fly. I mean, you can't you can't have a, a plane on the side that you're you're going to throw it like a brick, and attach a propeller to the back and have it you know, be a be a new te technology. It's just not going to work. So convergent evolution is species randomly evolve to have a similar physical appearance, but that doesn't mean that they're that they're related at all.
So, so convergent evolution is not speciation. All right, so now we're going to talk about something called sexual selection. And this is a very interesting thing. So sexual selection. I joke around with my, with my uh, high school students that like, for example, uh, whenever they see a teenage boy that's, I don't know, dressing like the style, I don't know, has the Beats headphones, has the cool hoodie on, I don't know, the Nikes uh, shoes, um, I don't know, has a cool hairstyle going, is that's, that's, that's going to be, be much more appealing than the guy walking around, unkempt hair, um, uh, a shirt that has holes in it, um, um, uh, texting on his, on his Nokia from 1999, that isn't, that, that isn't appealing as someone to, to, uh, to go out on a date with. So humans, we also have, um, there's also this thing in the human populations of sexual selection. And what this is, is that physical characteristics and behaviors increase chances of reproducing. So I'll give you an example well, there's, there's, there's several examples. One of my favorite is the birds of paradise. And these are birds that actually, um, they have to do a certain dance for the female. And if the dance isn't perfect, then, they, then the, the female bird will just fly away. I know, harsh. So let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting video that kind of shows sexual selection um, in action. But uh, so let's look up birds of paradise mating dance. Here we go. Uh, this one is good. Um, ah, yes. The famous David Attenborough never disappoints. Okay, I don't really want to watch an ad. Sorry, YouTube. No, sorry. Wait, I think I have to share the, I have to make sure I put an optimize for video. Okay. Uh, no, I want to optimize for video. Okay, cool. Birds of Paradise. Let's do it. Changes as you descend, becoming ever darker and damper favoring different kinds of animals and plants. Less than 2% of the sunlight reaches the floor, but even here, there is extraordinary variety. In the great island of New Guinea, there are 42 different species of birds of paradise, each more bizarre than the last. is so rich that nourishing food can be gathered very quickly. That leaves the male six-plumed bird of paradise with time to concentrate on other matters, like tidying up his display area. Everything must be spick and span. is ready.
Very impressive, but no one is watching. The superb bird of paradise calls to attract the female. And he has more luck. But what does he have to do to really impress her? She retires to consider her verdict. It's hard not to feel deflated when even your best isn't good enough. I know. Harsh. But that's an example of sexual selection in action. You're seeing that the male had to do a certain set of behaviors and had to have a certain physical appearance in order to be attractive to the female bird. And really, if you think about it, the females in a species, they select who mates with them. So what they desire goes in a, in a population. For example, peacocks, the bigger the, the feathers, the more appealing um, that, that bird is to mate. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite sayings in the animal kingdom is, he chased her and she caught him. Which if you think about it, is that, is that uh, yes, the, yes, the male has to do the majority of the work, but when the, the female chooses, then she accepts him. Well, that's kind of the thing with, with sexual selection is that she chooses which male has the best, the best characteristics to mate with her. Because of course, the goal of reproduction is to have genetically um, fit species, to have the offspring be as genetically fit as possible. And for whatever reason, the female birds in in the species that we just saw, uh, decided that male birds that could dance the best and look the most um, pristine, I guess, was the had the best traits needed to make successful offspring. Now, this also results in something called sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism. And what this means is that the males and females of a species, males and females of a species look different. As you saw in there, the female bird of paradise did not look nearly um, uh, similar or did not look um, similar at all to the male of the species. And that's because they don't have to. The male's job is to impress the female, not the other way around. It's kind of like when they say that um, the CEO in a meeting is usually the guy that's dressed in like um, a, in an untucked collar shirt and like jeans. That's because he has, he has nothing to prove. He runs the company. He doesn't need to impress anyone. All right, so now we're going to talk about types of selection. So types of natural selection. And these are models. These are models that basically determine how evolution occurs. So types of natural selection. And they usually follow one of three paths. One is called directional, which means that the um, the most common phenotype um, switches, well actually, the most common phenotype becomes less common 
do the change. But it still exists in the population, just is not as common. Next is what's called stabilizing. And this is um, uh, how should I put this? So, so stabilizing selection is um, narrow range. of a trait required for sur survival. So by narrow range, I mean like there is an ideal phenotype and it just can't shift much um, from that, that phenotype. So basically um, there's one phenotype that is successful and variants from that will decrease the, the chances of surviving. And last one is called disruptive. Um, uh, is disruptive. And what this is, is major change, usually a natural disaster of some sort, causes the outliers to become more common. To become more common. So some kind of uh, so some kind of disaster um, is caused, and because of that, the outliers in the population become more common. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about directional first. So once again, in directional selection, environmental change, usually environmental change, environmental change. causes a less common phenotype to become more common. So let's say in a population we have, so we'll say X is going to be group, Y is going to be um, uh, numbers group. So let's say that we have in a forest, let's say we have um, bright green. Actually, let me do it in the color that, that it is. So let's say for the color of moths, we have bright green. Then we have black, well, actually dark green. And then we have black. And let's say the forest is this color here. So this is what the forest looks like. It's dark green, therefore it makes sense that green moths would have the best chance to survive. They can blend in with the environment, hide from predators, and they can sneak up on prey. Now we see here that bright green um, moths and black moths, yeah, they can survive, but not in as large of uh, numbers. So we're going to say that the curve is going to look like this. Now, let's say that a factory is built not too far from the forest. And the ash and soot that results from burning the coal lands onto the forest and turns it a very darker grayish area. So it covers it with ash and it becomes darker and grayer. Because of this now, something has changed with the environment. The environment is now darker and more ashen. So what's going to happen here is that the green beetle is not going to, to be able to survive. And now the, the uh, dark green beetle will be able to survive, but it isn't as good of a phenotype. It isn't as successful of a phenotype as the um, black moths. So the curve is going to shift to the right like this. So we see that the curve is changing directions. It's just moving to the, to the, to the right. 
So in the new forest, yes, the dark green beetle can still survive, but now the most advantageous phenotype is the black moth. And the bright green moth cannot survive anymore because the forest is way too dark and the green moth will just stick out and won't be able to get prey and will get easily hunted by predators. Now the next is going to be what we call stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection. And this is a very specific trait um, must be present, must be present Variance is not well tolerated. Uh, there's several of examples here. Uh, let me think of one. Um, we can go ahead and say um, birth weight. This is a good one. So birth weight. I don't know the proper birth weights, but I'll just say here. We'll say that four pounds, so I'll do weight in pounds. And then the y-axis is going to be um, numbers. Let's say we have four pounds, seven pounds, and 10 pounds. Now, now let's say in the population, it starts off as being um, like this. So yes, there's a decent number of four pounds, decent number of seven, mostly seven pounds and a small number of 10 pounds. Okay, here's the problem. Now, seven pounds actually is the ideal phenotype. It is the most ideal variation. So it's gonna look like this. Actually, even more narrow than that. Now, why is that? Well, if a baby is too underweight, on the plus side is the mother, and we're, we're speaking about caveman times, the mother would be better able to run from predators and catch prey. So on the plus side, the mother will be more mobile. On the minus side is babies born premature, they don't have all of their organs developed and they have a very poor outcome for survival. Thankfully, modern medical technology has increased the odds um, or, the, or, the, or the chances of premature babies uh, surviving, thankfully. Now, if the baby is too, is too heavy on the, or on the, on the plus side, is the, is the baby will have had more time to develop and in theory, it will be born better able to fend for itself. Okay, not human babies, but it's just, I'm just giving you an, ex an example. On the minus side is the mother will be so weighed down with, well, baby, that she won't be as mobile, may not be able to run from, from, from predators or catch prey. Plus, um, well, a baby that's that big would not be able to be birthed naturally. Well, at least not with significant trauma cost to the, the mother. However, seven pounds is about perfect because the mother still is able to be relatively mobile, but, and the, the baby will be born just big enough for all of its organs to, to be developed. So, 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 so that's why almost all babies born falls in a very narrow range of size because about seven pounds is going to be the best phenotype, the best outcome for survival. And the last one is going to be what we call dis disruptive. And in disruptive selection, um, major change occurs, major change occurs that causes outliers 
to become more common. Uh, let's do an example of moths again. So in a, in a population, we are going to have um, black moths. We're going to have um, brown moths. And then we're going to have bright green moths. Let's say the forest happens to be bright green. Now, of course, bright green moths are going to be the most common because they get best blended in with the environment. Excuse me, sorry. Um, and yes, maybe the population can support a small number of black and brown moths, but not nearly as many. So this is going to be how the population looks right now. However, let's say that some disaster happens, maybe a volcano, I don't know, and covers this forest with ash. Well, now what has happened is that since this forest is now covered in ash, bright green moths are now going to be um, are going to be too visible now in the newly changed forest. So it is going to be basically wiped out of the population. And instead, the darker moths, which are a, which, which were normally the outliers, they're going to slowly become the most common moth because they'll be able to best survive in the population. So it's going to look like this. You see that the outliers are now the most prevalent and the phenotype that was most common is now relatively rare. So that is dis disruptive. The main phenotype or the primary phenotype actually becomes less advantageous and reduces it in numbers. And the secondary or, or the phenotypes that were the outliers not as likely to survive suddenly become more likely. So I hope you all enjoyed this lecture. We got a lot covered, some very interesting stuff, and I'll see you all back for chapter 13. See you soon.